we already talked about uh, the principle that we can get from sensor space into brain space by uh, using the inverse filter applied to the um, sensor data that we measured. And um, we can take this a little bit further. So first of all, a brief reminder, uh, one dipole is the equivalent of some cortical patch. For example, we can see the temporal lobe uh, subdivided into three surfaces, the basal part here in red, the uh, lateral surface in green, and the polar surface in blue. And uh, each of these, uh, when activated, will create a totally different topography on the scalp. Now, uh, we can um, use these three equivalent dipoles to model anything that comes from uh, that temporal lobe. And um, this would then result in a regional source in the temporal lobe that summarizes the activation uh, in that complete part of the brain. We can, for example, uh, have one regional source for the right temporal lobe, one for the left temporal lobe, and then add a few more sources around the brain to cover for uh, any other activity that goes on in other parts of the brain. We just need to make sure that we have covered uh, all active areas in the brain. So um, imagine if we only had uh, a temporal, uh, so the left temporal lobe uh, covered by a source and there was some activity in the right temporal lobe, some of that may potentially be picked up by that source in the left temporal lobe since we don't have anything to model that activity in the other hemisphere. But if we have these two sources in the two temporal lobes, then they will nicely separate the activity in the two uh, areas. And uh, other sources, if there's only activity in the temporal lobes, like shown up here, will not pick up anything else. For example, if we apply this principle of source montages to a somatosensory evoke potential data set, so on the left-hand side here, we can see um, the waveforms on the scalp measured for right median nerve stimulation and left median nerve stimulation. Uh, we can then apply a multiple source model to this data set. Uh, this source model has sources placed in the brainstem, in the thalamus, and in the somatosensory um, areas. And uh, these are now represented as um, little symbols in BESA research. And we can see, for example, on the right-hand side here, uh, in the right median nerve, the sources in the left somatosensory uh, area will pick up the activity. And for the left median nerve, the sources in the right somatosensory um, area will pick up the activity and be silent for the activity from the other side stimulation. <clears throat> so we get a very good separation of these different signals, even uh, in the BESA research um, review. And similarly, we can apply uh, a montage for um, an error-related negativity experiment here um, that uh, sort of can be applied to the individual single trials. And actually, the sources in the frontal cortex did pick up, even on the single trials, the um, reaction to a false response by the subject. Uh, where the sources in the occipital part of the brain in the, at the same time picked up the alpha rhythm. Yeah, and let's try this for some um, data. I will now load a data set to uh, demonstrate this. And uh, uh, for the moment, we're just going to start again with our um, all subjects file, which I've still got in my memory here. So um, this all subjects file has um, some sensor data, and now we want to transform them into a source space and generate a source montage. To do this, uh, select this condition high, uh, send it into the source analysis module, <clears throat> and I've already got my solution open uh, for the high condition that was generated earlier with my three oriented regional sources. Now, um, one thing I need to do uh, in BESA to generate a source montage myself is to um, sort of convert these oriented regional sources into dipoles. So that's done um, simply by um, selecting a source and press the C 
key on the keyboard, C for convert. So I press this key and I can see now these three waveforms uh, disentangle into three individual sources. They are still all in the same position, same orientation, uh, um, same mathematical model, it's just a different representation. So instead of my regional sources, three orientations, I've now got my three dipoles with the three orientations. And I do the same for the second one and for the third one. And now I've, instead of having my three regional sources, I've got my nine dipole sources. Now I can save this as a source montage. So I can go into the file menu and save source montage as, let's call it tests in all subjects CC test two. That's my source montage. And if I now go back, uh, if I minimize this window and go back to the um, data, I can now see that my data in the review window have been transformed into these different source waveforms. So um, I've now disentangled this data. It's quite interesting to see, for example, if I look at the um, this uh, frontal source that was only present in the high condition, uh, how that evolves over, t over the different conditions. So in 60 decibels, it's silent. And from about 90 decibels, it becomes prominent and then very strong in the 100 decibel case. And otherwise, I can see these uh, activations in the um, cortical, uh, in the auditory cortex area. And um, these montages can also be applied to the uh, raw data. So if I now go to File, Open, and um, go to the raw data for one of these subjects, this one. I can then, uh, from the user, I can uh, see that this montage is also available here as a user montage, and I can now transform my raw data uh, into these source montage waveforms uh, in the same way as I did my average data. <clears throat> so and, uh, we're going to work with this in the next uh, section on the time frequency analysis some more. and. Um, now I'm just going to um, go and quickly talk to you about artifact correction because that's another important aspect in data analysis. Artifact correction is, uh, of course, something that you usually do quite early on in the data processing, but it's also something that uh, it helps us to, uh, now that we've already understood some of the principles, we can talk about uh, the different uh, implications of different methods more easily. This is about different methods for artifact correction. And basically what it's all about is the topography. So we have eye blinks, we have cardiac artifacts and potentially other artifacts, but they are, um, at least if they are not electrode artifacts, they are, uh, they are characterized by one topography that um, is, the is the same or stable over the recording and we want to get rid of them. So to do this, um, we need to watch out for a couple of things. Uh, one thing is that we have a correlation with the signal of interest, potentially. So if we compare this eye blink topography here on the left with our auditory uh, N1 topography, they are not exactly the same, but they're also not completely uncorrelated. So both are central, both are, uh, have a frontal um, component in them, so they are less than 50%, but more than 10% correlated, I would say. So if we simply correct by uh, subtracting the topography of the eye blink from the data, then this will result in some distortion of our auditory N1 topography. Um, we're going to remove everything that's correlated with this uh, eye blink, and this is going to uh, hurt. This is going to distort our um, signal of interest. So that's the kind of artifact correction that we don't um, advocate. Instead, we think that good artifact correction means that you also look at your brain activity of interest, and um, you try and protect this brain activity of interest from any distortion as much as possible. So. In order to do this, we need to know something about it. So first of all, we need to estimate our artifact signal, but we also need to estimate our brain activity of interest. 
and then uh, there's some noise as well. Um, how do we do this? So the artifact signal can be estimated, for example, by averaging multiple variations of the same artifact. And this is um, frequently done, and, and BESA can be done very elegantly using a pattern search, for example. Uh, the brain activity of interest, there we have different methods available. So, um, we, in fact, there's three different methods in BESA research. One is the so-called adaptive method, one is the surrogate method, and the last one is the independent component analysis, or in short, ICA. So let's start with the adaptive method. We have an artifact signal that we can average. So here on the left-hand side, we can see uh, the topography of the artifacts, very nicely averaged. Uh, we do a PCA of that, we get a topography, and now we want to contrast that with the brain activity of interest. And uh, for the brain activity of interest, we can make some assumptions. For example, we can say that we think that we looking at anything that has an amplitude of less than 100 microvolts, because a higher amplitude is most likely to be artifact. We also want to check that the correlation with our artifact topography is less than 50%. Um, and if these two are the case, then we think this could be brain activity of interest. And on this subset of data, we can perform a principal component analysis and keep anything that's got variance of, of at least 10% of the overall um, <clears throat> activity. Because we're not so interested in, in protecting background activity or noise, we just want to protect the brain activity that we want to analyze. We say all the PCA components that explain more than 10% variance, these are considered brain activity of interest. And these will be protected. So this kind of chunk, yeah, green chunk here, this is what we protect from any correction. And the rest can be distorted by the artifact correction. And what that results in is that uh, instead of getting a distorted N1, we get a nice undistorted N1. Yeah, and we have other methods called um, the so-called surrogate method, where we do, where we use a a model of data, and then uh, we estimate that as a brain activity of interest. So this is helpful if you already have some idea about where in your brain the activity of interest is. And um, I'm not going to go into this uh, because we are going to run out of time, but um, it's a similar concept. And um, the last one is the independent component analysis. And here um, we perform a independent component analysis of the whole data set. And usually the number of components we get from this is equal to the number of channels that were recorded. And um, then we can pick out uh, the components that actually resemble our artifact. For example, uh, here this little screenshot shows us um, ICA4, which has a nice rhythmic um, cardiac artifact, or ICA2, which uh, shows us the blink artifact. So we can check on the topographies of these, and we can subtract them. And um, this is uh, also a method that preserves our signal of interest in uh, uh, quite a good way, because these uh, ICA components are independent of each other, but they are not orthogonal to each other. So they can have overlapping PCA topographies. That's a nice feature of the ICA, and this is probably why it's so successful, because it's a simple way of uh, excluding uh, components, but they will not distort other components. So these uh, components, these ICA components, always are potentially overlapping in topography. Uh, they can be correlated to other ICA, topography, um, ICA components. And that means if I take one of them out, I still have um, some uh, correlating activity that's summarized by other ICA components that is kept. So we'll only introduce a small distortion doing this. So in summary, um, we want to keep an undistorted N1 waveform in this case, that's our target, which we will not achieve by a simple subspace projection, that's a no-go. Uh, the other methods of artifact correction are all good methods of artifact correction. 
Now this was a bit theoretical, so let's do some practical work on this. I'm going to go back. First of all, I'm going to go close this window. And now I'm going to go back to my data. And um, I'm going to show you an example where this is quite instructive. Let's go and load a... Mm, so we already know this data set. It's the subject one in our auditory intensity example, only that uh, we've additionally averaged an eye blink. So um, if I go to the uh, standard screen, I can see uh, my different um, average components. And uh, I can see the eye blink on the left-hand side. And I've uh, changed my montage to a virtual reference fee montage because that was just easier to look at the data. Um, and I'm going to use just the first two seconds of the data to um, show you what the effect of the different artifact correction methods could be. Now let's start with uh, the one that we don't like. So first of all, I'm going to go to the artifact menu and uh, select an artifact topography and um, yeah I've already uh, pre-selected one I can see there's uh, three PCA components in this um, topography for the artifact that I've averaged on the left hand side and the first one already accounts for 99% of variance for that artifact so it's enough to just use the first artifact component for correction I have got a second tab here called the Estimate Signal tab, which I can choose. And here I can decide what kind of uh, artifact correction I want to perform. So SSP correction, surrogate model, or adaptive model. So let's go for the SSP just uh, to see what that's like. And press OK. And now I can see that um, my data are now corrected. So I've got this blue label here corrected. At the bottom, I get an additional virtual channel in Bezo Research uh, called Blink Channel, which shows me where there is some activity. I can scale this up a bit to see where um, Bezo Research thinks there's a Blink activity. And uh, yeah, I can already see that uh, the Blink activity comes up uh, also in the first averaged condition here. And this is because it's got some correlation with our uh, data of interest. So if I now um, show a map at around 100 milliseconds, oops, I have to drag it over a bit. Um, now I can see that this map has got an additional uh, component. The N100 is now distorted. So I can see this red nose here. If I if I switch the correction off, I can see this is the undistorted N1. This is the one I want. Um, and if I uh, apply my subspace projection, then uh, my map gets distorted simply because that correlated topography of the blink gets subtracted from the data. That's the effect of the subspace projection. And let's see what the artifact correction does if I I select a different method. So I'm going to go back to Artifact, Select, Estimate Signal, and now I'm going to choose the Adaptive method. And I can see that uh, in the Adaptive method I get uh, some additional options because now I need to um, estimate the brain activity of interest. And um, I've now got the chance to define some parameters, so uh, what uh, what should my, be my amplitude for brain activity of interest, maximum correlation with artifact subspace, etc. And um, I can view the waveforms of my brain activity of interest. And I can see on that screen that um, the most variance is in this uh, N100 part. And then there's a few more components that will also be protected from the artifact um, correction. So if I use this method and press OK, now I can see um, that uh, I've, again, got a correction. Uh, so let me see what the map looks like now. And now I can see that even after correction, 
my map, my N1 is nearly undistorted, so it's almost as nice as um, if I hadn't had to correct for any artifacts. So um, go. let me switch off the correction. There's a shortcut, Control E on the keyboard for this, and look at the map. So this is without the correction. With the correction, there's hardly any difference. So of course, it's very it's easier on average data because uh, there I've got better separation of brain activity of interest and not interest. So, but even in non-average data, I still get much better results using the adaptive method. And uh, I'll also have a look at the uh, ICA. So that's the third method I would like to discuss. <coughs> um, so for this, I need to open um, my original data set. So let me pick the S1. Uh, this is the uh, first subject of this uh, experiment. And um, I, can, I can press this ICA button here. And then I get some options. So um, let me show you the options. Uh, I can choose the method. Currently, it's only the extended info max, but we'll expand that soon. Uh, I can also decide that I want to reduce the data uh, by only keeping certain uh, components that explain at least 1% variance. But if I switch this off, then I should get uh, exactly as many components as I have channels. So if I now apply this ICA on the current screen, let's see what the result is. And the result um, is, yeah, that I get 31 components. I can now uh, choose different components to uh, exclude them from the data. So this one, uh, the SA number two, that shows me my eye blink. Let's, uh, let's map the topography for this. Yeah, this is a very classical eye blink topography. <coughs> this is ICA number four, that's the one with the Cardiac artifact, I can also map this topography, and uh, this is mainly in the inferior electrodes here. So I can um, now do the following. I can uh, right-click on the ICA2, and I can um, export the reconstructed data without this component, or I can select more components if I want to, and uh, just use the whole file, I export the whole file without this component. And this will then call it S1 ICA test. So create a, create a new file. So let me open this file. Yeah, that's my new data file, and um, now it's completely rid of eye blinks. So all these pattern ones here, tag number one, this is where the eye blinks were, and they're now gone. So I can go back and compare to my uh, previous file. This was my my uh, file before the export. So I can see the eye blink here, eye blink there. This is what it looked like, and um, now it's um, been uh, changed into a file without eyebling. So the ICA is also an elegant way of um, yeah, using uh, artifact correction in, uh, without too much distortion of your data. One more thing to mention is that uh, if I go back to this file, if I want to do source analysis, it's better not to use artifact corrected data in the source analysis um, because source analysis uh, doesn't know the weights in which the artifact topography was used on the data so it needs to subtract that subspace from the data in order to be on the safe side and it's a better approach to uh, know the artifact so to average the artifact then to uh, send the data to source analysis and to additionally load the artifact. So, for example, if I open this solution here, 
if I can now append my artifact topography to this solution. So I can use File Append Solution and um, I can use a file of type artifact topography here. And um, this is the one I've been using. So now I've got my iBlink topography that's appended to the solution. Um, and I can see that there is a little bit of influence on the solution. So if I don't use this iBlink and I do my fit, then I can see the sources move sort of a little bit more frontal to account for um, some of the eye activity. And if I switch my eye artifact on this component and do the fit of everything, then they'll move back into the auditory uh, region. So the, the eye blink and the solution, they can coexist in the, um, in the source analysis, but it's better to, to add a model for the eye blink and, and do the source analysis together with the model than to correct for the eye blink and then do the source analysis afterwards.